Okay, we're back live. Um, we're going to get going. We're going to try and stay on schedule for the uh, folks watching on the live stream. I'm really excited to see this session. I keep learning more and more about InfoSight, probably more than what will stick in my brain, uh, given my random access memory only holds so much. But I think this will be a really good session, interactive. Um, you guys are going to show some of the the new functionality with the AI driven stuff. Mm -hmm. So one thing, one thing I'll say about that, and I'm sure you're gonna, you can hit on this better than me since you're the product manager. Um, you know, I think um, continues to be good at is predictive analytics. This taking the next step to um, AI and actually applying intelligence to help make decisions is really kind of the vision that we're focusing on in terms of what does it do from here on forward. So. Tim, you kind of threw out there AI. I think it's one point. I think you mentioned about it. Didn't you say AI at one point or? Not when AI. You, I was what did you say? Uh, different memory, spin torque memory, and <laughs> yeah, oh, spin torque. Oh, come on, you show off. Cut it out. Somebody had talked to something. Somebody maybe uh, I don't know. Somebody had said something about AI and InfoSight. But the fact that InfoSight now does AI is really, really pretty new. Um, and you guys are going to yeah. show us, take us, take us through some of that. So cool, very cool. Thanks, Calvin. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, cool. So my name is Roshan Dhand. I'm the Director of Product Management for InfoSight. I've uh, been with InfoSight for a little over six years now, uh, from the time we launched it. Um, and before I go into you know talking about what it is, what's new, and what our vision is, I just want to get a quick feel for how familiar are you guys with InfoSight? So who here, I'm sure everybody knows the term, but who is pretty familiar with its main capabilities and what it can do for the customer? You use it and you register your clients. That's awesome. <laughs> That's great to hear. Two people are familiar. So I'll, I'll try to meld, maybe uh, you know, go into the basics of why is it so cool, what does it do for the customer at the end of the day. Uh, but I also want to go a little bit more behind the scenes than we might have done before in terms of the actual AI and the machine learning be, uh, behind the scenes. It takes a lot of um, data science to come up with hard to predict problems and predict them accurately. And today we have our data scientist here who will actually walk you through some of those algorithms, but at a very high level and also do a demo. Um, and so that's going to be the focus here to take you more behind the scenes. Also help you tell the difference between when something is very mature and very sophisticated in terms of how it predicts and how many problems it can solve and how quickly it learns versus something that is just sitting at the shim, giving you basic stats that can be collected through any APIs and sort them and filter them through different, uh, different means. There's a big difference in two types of predictive analytics offerings that you will, you will see out there. So with that, I'll just get started a little bit on, um, let me get my timer going so I give the data science enough time and get out of the way. Um, so you know, we all know this is the era of instant gratification where be it in our personal lives or be it data that we want for our businesses from the applications, we want it instantly, we want it when we want it. And this is something that is absolutely not acceptable, not in our generation, definitely not in the next generation. And the fundamental premise behind InfoSight is your application needs to be running optimally and be available at all times. What happens below the application tier, the many, many layers of software and the many layers of hardware infrastructure underneath, it doesn't matter to the application user. They just they assume it's all going to work. It's going to work optimally and be up and running all the times. But in reality, what happens really is this is a cycle that our IT uh, admins are stuck in endlessly. And that cycle starts with a very reactive notification of something that went uh, wrong. The admin then pours over graphs and graphs and data. And you know we have some some. Uh, capabilities that can correlate logs, for instance, but they're still looking at a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of things that are hard to uh, interpret, and sometimes even coming from different silos within the IT organization. They try to correlate that, make sense of that. And then uh, my clicker is not working. Okay, it's a little slow. And then spending countless hours on an interpretation, very often at the end of the day, if it's really a hairy problem, a significant problem, they end up calling vendor support. And I won't go too much into that. I think we have all had experience with how vendor support can do, even for the 
best meaning enterprise organization that there is. Uh, so this is the cycle that is very familiar and this is what with InfoSight we, uh, we have aimed to and have been able to break. I'm actually gonna get rid of my clicker and just go to. So disruption of business, wasted time with people over silos talking to each other, uh, just a lot of uh, lack of productivity. What our vision is that the infrastructure, just like the self-driving car, should manage itself. You plug it in, you set it up, and it should just go, and it should do what it's supposed to do at all times. If it breaks, if something goes wrong, it should figure out, predict, and then itself know what to fix and how to fix it, and then actually go fix it, and also run optimally at any given time. So basically, very close to the analogy of a self-driving car, where infrastructure should just manage itself. And this needs to happen not just at any one tier like storage or service, but this needs to happen across your infrastructure stack, across your applications, because from an end user's perspective, they don't care where any glitch comes from or where the problem lies. They just want the whole stack to work with each other. And this then automates your entire uh, data center. So you take the pieces that are automated, they know how to work within themselves, they know how to work with each other, and as a result, you have a data center that is working optimally and working, running on its own, predicting issues and running on, on its own. But what does that really take? What that takes is collecting telemetry and different kinds of data from across the data center, from each and every equipment and piece of software that is in the data center. Uh, with Nimble Storage, we did it from the very beginning when our first um, uh, appliance shipped. It was shipped with very rich telemetry that it was sending back to the cloud. This is um, not just log data, but log data, events, configuration information, and lots of uh, telemetry data time series performance information, uh, for example. It sent it all to the cloud, not just from the appliance, but also what were critical applications at the time, and still is, for example, VMware, sending, it, sending that back, from, from the, um, back to the cloud as well. And there, we then ran uh, different kinds of uh, AI and data science related algorithms to look into this data and make sense of it. So now this is a very vast corpus of data across very diverse environments, not you know two customer environments are never the same, and also just large quantities of data. And over that we ran uh, analytics, some of the very advanced analytics Aditya will go into uh, right now. Um, and we learn from these global uh, environments and it feeds on itself. It, it improves itself, their algorithms approve itself. Um, what we have very recently introduced is what we're calling a recommendation engine, and we'll go a little bit more into that, which is the latest part of the algorithms. Uh, so based on all this corpus of data that was coming back, and we have data scientists looking into and automating things, what we were able to do is provide our customers with what we call predictive support automation. What that does is we are sitting on hundreds and hundreds of fingerprints of what a problem looks like, and when do you know and a problem is going to occur, and whenever we see that fingerprint match any install base at any time, any instance in the install base, we automatically open a support case and we automatically bring that issue on our radar and our customer's radar. And so, you know, this is a, almost like what our customers call being an MSP for a customer without really being an MSP for them, where we are able to predict issues and not just predict, but we're able to bring it on their radar and our radar automatically without any human intervention in the whole cycle. Um, where we've gone from there now is, you know, it's great to tell a customer what your problem is. You can say, hey, this is the problem, this is exactly where the problem has occurred, what we call a root cause analysis. We can do instant root cause analysis. But we've gone further now and we are able to tell the customer how to solve it. And it's not always intuitive, but we have realized that you go to the doctor and the doctor just tells you you have a fever and this is your diagnosis. That's not what you came for. What you want is exactly how can you heal yourself? What is it that you need? And you want the doctor to be pretty confident behind their, uh, their recommendation. And that is where we are going now, where we are able to tell what is it that you need to do to actually solve that problem? And here we are calling them preemptive recommendations, and we'll go into more details. Where we're taking the future there is actually now that we know what the problem is, we have a very high confidence answer of what the recommendation is, go, we go and take an action. Actually fix that problem for you. Why do you need a human being in, the, in that loop when 
through AI and machine learning, you can predict and know what the answer is and just go and take an action. Of course, it needs building a lot of confidence in the install base. You know, initially people will want a lot of control over something like that. And over time, when they build confidence, they, they'll go ahead and start um, you know, actually using that capability to, to self-manage and make changes. And the beauty of this whole thing is that it continuously improves itself. And so the more data we get from the install base, the more we learn, the more we learn, the more accurate we are, and more we are able to predict. So it's almost like that brain is becoming smarter and smarter as time goes on, even with no action or no investment from our side. If you actually invest and constantly look for new things, new problems to solve, which our data scientists do, it becomes even, even more effective that way. So there is the cross-stack element that is very important because, as I said, you know, each individual component of a stack can work very well in its own silo, but when you put things together is where very often the problem lies and also makes it very hard to troubleshoot. There is a, an AI platform that we have in the cloud that learns from the entire install bit, tens of thousands of instances out there in very diverse environments. And on top of that, we have this direct customer impact. And I'll go into examples of the customer impact so it can uh, bring, bring home the point a little bit. Uh, some very concrete examples. So what have we been able to do as a result of all this uh, predictive analytics and, uh, and AI in the cloud? Uh, we have been able to prevent 86% of issues that would have been reported to us and would have been opened as support cases. So these are support cases that our system automatically detected and then was able to automatically close because it was through just algorithmically figure out what the problem is and what the solution should be. So you've all heard of the terms AI ops. So uh, you know, it used to be called algorithmic in, uh, intelligence, algorithm, algorithmic IT operations, which is what Gartner had introduced, and then they made it AI-driven IT operations. Well, 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 Yes, definitely. The notifications go to the end user, the end user finds out what's happened, you know, through whatever not notification means they have set up, uh, and then it also brings it on our radar. Sometimes it may be a small change that they need to make. If it's easy to tell them what it is to fix it, you know, if we go ahead and close the case, so the user has gotten the notification, they've gotten what they need to do, and there's a record of it, and it's come on our radar. Sometimes our support engineers will look at it and think this warrants a call for some reason. They will follow up with a phone call. Support case will remain open. Or the end user may say, I know you said this is going to fix it. I still want you to keep this open, and then we'll keep it open. Uh, uh, 20Q, both controllers automatically reboot last weekend uh, without any notification and never got tickets on it or anything. Yeah, that should not happen. But we can definitely look into it. I mean, we can follow up with that. You're saying the controllers reboot it, yeah, and you didn't get OK. We should find out. Yeah, so that system has detected it. Why the notification has not gone, we should find out. Because we actually know when controllers reboot, and we capture that. So that night, when your configuration data goes. So there's so different frequencies, some very um, dis potentially disruptive uh, incidences we won't get notified of immediately. Some come in a few hours, and the whole configuration package comes once in 24 hours. And this should be caught uh, in each of those. Yeah. Minimal array that I yeah. put into info set. Yeah. I don't know what the three pars do, but this is my first info set, or right. first nimble, and I wanted to yeah. know how that's handled. Yeah. So I would love to follow that up all the way to the, the end and see what happens, because there could be some missing link somewhere uh, for that. Probably something you did. <laughs> <laughs> An info site account or one of the old store, uh, shoot, uh, anyways. Store friend. Store friend. Store friend. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, well, I couldn't even register the Nimble. I actually had to call support to even get it registered. So that was going to be one of my other questions is how we go about registering these arrays into info site if we don't already have an array registered to begin yeah. with. Yeah, we should follow that up. So one of the things we did as a Nimble, which is still true for Nimble, and that model eventually will come. Uh, to the rest of HPE, you know, we are, I mean, we can talk about uh, what we are working on. The engineering teams are working very hard on um, integrating, bringing this InfoSight like customer experience and support experience, both external experience and our internal experience, 
to the rest of the HP product line. So 3PAR has gotten quite a lot of that capability is the farthest ahead. In fact, they're doing some things that even Nimble did not do. For example, they have on-prem on analytics now uh, or coming soon. But it's also coming to SimpliVity. It's coming to the ProLine servers, uh, the Superdome Flex, the, uh, the high-end servers are from HP. So we are working with these to bring all of that in. Um, and uh, yeah, so what we were able to do was we actually at, at Nimble never hired a level one and level two engineer, support engineer. All the level one and level two support engineering work was automated and eliminated just through predictive analytics. So if you pick up the phone and call Nimble support, which Nimble support actually sits within the Nimble organization, it's not part of the HPE support, you get, you go directly to, yes. <laughs> You know, I have to give give kudos there because I think it takes a lot of uh, appetite for risk for a big company like that to change a model. You know, small company gets acquired by big companies. First thing you do is you take common functions and distribute it across the company so you can you know save money. Um, but uh, in case of HPE, they actually left Nimble Support with Nimble Support, acknowledging that this is a new way enterprises are going to do support and we need to learn from this. So definitely, it's and, a, it was a great move. And it was the number one question when we acquired Nimble, as everybody yeah. asked. That was the first thing. Are you yeah. guys going to make this part of HPE Support? Because if you are, we're out. Right. And, <laughs> and it was like, nope, right. we are not. We're yeah. going to keep it exactly the and way it is. And already, I think it's been now a little over 12 months for the acquisition, but the products integrate 18 months for acquisition. I think there was a time when engineers were allowed to talk to each other. There was another legal you know, timeline from then. And within a very short period of time, we were able to integrate with 3PAR. And the support experience has changed a little bit, but there's a lot to go, and we're actually working on that. But coming back to the point, we don't have L1, L2 engineers at Nimble Storage. If you pick up the phone, you know, the average response time, if you actually call the phone uh, on, on the phone, is less than a minute or so less than uh, 60 seconds. Somebody will answer the call, and that person will be an L3 engineer. That will be someone who has been doing tech support in storage for many, many years and is very qualified, would have been a level three engineer at another vendor. And the way we've been able to eliminate this is problems that are solvable through machine. You just solve it. It doesn't even come to us. And so it's a huge cost savings uh, for the company as well. Uh, so something like login, et cetera, we need to look into because we don't have level one, level two engineers to answer. So if you're calling in for a login problem, it's a level three engineer. We're very motivated to eliminate the need to, uh, to call. The other thing we noticed was the availability. Uh, we actually measured, this is actual measured availability in the field. This is not in a lab somewhere under very special circumstances or a theoretical availability. This is actual measured availability of InfoSight. Uh, this is measured along Nimble storage, but this is something that's going to come to others as well. And we have uh, six lines of measured availability across uh, Nimble storage. And this is a testament to the fact that we can predict and prevent problems so the arrays don't go down. And we can build a better product because our engineering is constantly looking to see how is this array behaving, how is this piece of software behaving in the customer environment, what can we learn from it, and how can we build a better product. So I don't know that you can answer this. I don't want to necessarily mm -hmm. put you on the spot, but I'm going to since I just said that. <laughs> You've been doing this for six years. Do you have any idea what that availability was six years ago? I mean, how, yeah, how, how has much been, has it improved? Yeah, no, it has been improving. So six years ago, actually, I don't, I don't remember exact numbers, but I remember sharing four nines of availability, I then slowly five four nines nine of, is what yeah. I've heard. And I, we used to look at a six-month window, uh, you know, a posterior window, but then we started looking at bigger windows. So this has now been uh, six nines for a very long time. Yeah. And it takes a lot to move these needles on these nines because it can get wiped out very, very uh, quickly. And, uh, and I, I, don't know, I don't know what other vendors are talking about, but I'm, I'm going to hazard a guess. There's not too many vendors out there with a, two, with a dual array controller array that can say that they're doing six nines. I mean, remember... Yeah. Um, Chuck, uh, <clears throat> Chuck Hollis several years ago saying, you know, if you got a dual controller array, there's no way you can do 6.9, and there's, so therefore there's no way you're, you know, mission critical array. Yeah, um, and, yeah exactly. And we actually offer this. He doesn't. <laughs> he doesn't. He, he's actually for a different, he works for a different company now, so. technology sector either. And this is actually a guarantee that we are able to offer with some of our product lines. We actually offer this kind of availability guarantee. And the reason we can guarantee and stand behind it is because we have observed these numbers over a vast period of time, and it gives us the confidence to put our neck out there and say, you know what, this is something we will stand behind. Um, another uh, statistics that may be interesting to, uh, to share with you, you know, I said we don't have level one, level two engineers. We only have level three engineers. So think of it as having less than a third of the support staff. 
track that other companies do uh, because they tend to have a lot of level one, a few level two, even fewer level three. So I would even guess maybe a fourth or a fifth of number of people other people have in support staff. But we also have the policy of not turning a customer away. So if you call up with a problem and it seems like it may not be a storage problem, you're calling Nimble Storage, it may be a VMware problem, we won't turn you away, we will solve that problem for you. And when we looked at our cases, we saw that 54% of the time when we resolved a ca uh, case, it was um, not a problem that ha had anything to do with storage. For example, it was a VMware configuration that we had the customer change. It was something to do on, you know, in the network, for example, we had the customer change. So how can we do with such few people solve such a vast uh, corpus of problems? It's because of the automation. It's because of the AI. We get a lot of telemetry from the VMware tier as well. We have lots and lots of tools that are built on it. And our AI is able to point the level three engineer very quickly in the correct direction and say, this is, like, this is where the problem is. They go look into it. There's a last bit that they're doing manually, which we want to automate down the road, and they're able to solve that problem. And so, so this is this, this phrase we use a lot, which where we say, see a problem once and prevent for all. We don't ever want that situation where you pick up the phone and you call support, and support says, well, yeah, you know, we've spent hours troubleshooting this, you've experienced an outage, but this is a known bug and this is the number of the bug, and then come back when we fix it. If it was a known bug, why, why didn't you know about it? That, is, that should be the expectation of the customer, where if the vendor has knows of an issue, they should know whether it applies to you or not, and they should proactively inform you of it, prevent you from falling into the trap as well, and try to fix it for you. So our mantra is, see once, prevent always. So if we know of an issue, we are sitting on hundreds and hundreds, reaching more than a thousand fingerprints, a corpus of fingerprints within our, um, our database, where all known problems so far have been, we've made a signature out of that, and we run that across our install base. The attach rate for InfoSight for Nimble Storage, for example, is 95% plus. So we do know what's going on in our install base, and for most people, we are able to prevent issues if it is a known bug to us. And these issues are across the board. I mentioned earlier we're getting telemetry, not just about performance. We get logs, we get events, we get configuration information. So we are able to solve a vast variety of problems. So now let's get into the specifics of very specific examples of what we do and specific features uh, behind all of this. Um, so with Nimble Storage, for example, and I keep using Nimble Storage, even though these capabilities are coming very quickly to other parts of the portfolio so you can get an idea of what's been proven and what to expect from other products in, in the portfolio. For Nimble Storage, uh, every storage array, think of it as has a customized upgrade software upgrade path. What I mean by that is we know exactly what this uh, storage array is doing. You know, it's like it's wearing all these electrodes that you can look inside the body and you know what it's doing. We know what firmware version it has. We know what future firmware versions it can go to. And you know a lot about these future firmware versions because of the counters built in, because of incidences we've seen in the past and are sitting on this corpus of you know, incident data. We can tell a customer, hey, you, you should not go from this release to this other release because it may cause problems to you, even though it may not have caused problems for others. And so we can put this customer on a blacklist, for example, and say, say you have 4.1, for you specifically, do not go to 4.2 because you have this configuration setting which may give you problems. And so when the customer goes to upgrade, they see a blacklist, they see a reason of why they're on the blacklist, they call support, or they see for themselves what, what, you know, how they can resolve that, they go resolve it, and the blacklist comes off. So this is keeping customers from shooting themselves in the foot because new firmware versions it doesn't matter how much QA you do on them, they can always uncover issues that were lying latent in your infrastructure for years and years. And so having all that data, we do a blacklist so that every customer has a successful upgrade path. I just looked recently um, and I saw that across the install base, we have about 60% of our install base is on a software release that came out in the last 12 months or later. We're talking about enterprise storage here, right? We're not talking about browsers and laptops. 60% of the install base is at a firmware version that came out in the last 
12 months or, or later. And the reason being there is a very, very high confidence in our software upgrades because it, it, because of AI, it gets tested that no human being can test in a QA environment. Um, so there's very high confidence that helps us as well. The more people get off older versions, the more economical it is for the company as well. Uh, this is another problem where we uh, prevented an issue before a customer knew about it. So there was a, a controller went down unexpectedly, something like what's happened in the example in the room. Um, and then our, um, our engineers actually uh, saw, uh, they did an, a, a, a proactive analysis and they saw that there was, um, uh, you know, they could figure out what the problem was. So engineers can solve problems very, very quickly because they have, you know, think of it at thousands and thousands of stethoscopes built into the array. So when there is a problem, we get notified and they're very quickly able to go in and identify what the problem is. I mean, we've solved very difficult memory leak problems, for example, in a matter of 24 hours. These are problems that are not reproducible easily, but we're able to solve it once we see it. So within 24 hours, uh, we were able to diagnose what the problem is, create a patch, and issue the patch to that customer. Um, and then once we see this problem with one customer, we scan the entire install base that's connected to us, which is you know about 95% plus. And we saw that there were 40 customers that could have potentially uh, hit that issue. They hadn't hit it yet, but they had all the markers that our fingerprint came up with, and we contacted them and said, you know what, you should install this patch because you may hit this problem which you haven't hit today. And it's very surgical. So these are 40 customers out of thousands of customers. So it's very surgical, it's very precise, and it's preventing these people from, from ever having that problem ever again. Another example is, uh, you know, we did a firmware upgrade on our side, and when we did a firmware upgrade, we exposed a bug in ESX, which is VMware's hypervisor, in their tier. Their hypervisor had not completely written to the iSCSI spec. There was an, you can call it an illegal command. I don't think anybody ever writes 100% to the spec. But our firmware upgrade exposed that bug on the ESX uh, tier. As soon as we found that out, we could very quickly uh, identify it. You know, when the first customer hit it, we actually identified that problem, created a fix. We reported the bug to VMware, but we didn't wait. We changed our own software. And we found in our install base that 600 systems were actually exposed to that same capability. They had not hit the bug yet, but they would have hit the bug. And so we reached out to these 600 systems and we had them upgrade to this patch very quickly. So this is an example of proactively helping the customers not hit an issue instead of going through that cycle of hitting the issue, having downtime, doing debugging with you know, tools that seem very primitive, primitive now in the age of AI and, and ML. So just a quick thing to throw in. So, I mean, you're kind of hinting at it, but um, you know, 3 par is, you didn't hint at this, 3PAR uh, is today on InfoSight. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have a personal story that I won't tell a lot of it, but my son-in-law actually works on the 3PAR Peak team. Ah, oh, awesome. Um, and it's a great he's team. part yeah. of the team that's actually writing the digital signatures that will go out and, you know, proactively find issues and then mm -hmm. resolve them. Um, there's not nearly as many of those on 3PAR today as there are on, on Nimble because you guys have been doing those for, what, eight years on, or how long? Yeah, so. So yeah. they're just getting going, but they're going to start to see a, you know, a, a, a huge increase in the number of the, the digital signatures on 3PAR. But we've, we've already had some stories like that with 3PAR where right. like, there was a customer running VDI and didn't know what the issue was, but apparently customers were logging off their terminals mm -hmm. and um, virus scan was running at night, but it was causing these huge spikes in I.O. and the customer didn't realize it was because of this. And they were about ready to submit POs for new 3PARs, new servers, because they thought they had a performance issue that they were going to throw hardware out. They got InfoSight running on their 3 par arrays. They went and looked, and they saw that what was happening. They realized, wait a minute, these are people that are logged off. What's going on? Yeah. They eventually figured out that the problem was um, a virus scan that was running at night that was just doing something wrong and sucking IOs. They solved the problem. They put off over a million dollars of uh, um, hardware that they were going to buy because InfoSight helped them find that it was actually an issue with um, with a virus scan that was just doing wacky things in the middle of the night. Yeah, so great example. Definitely, uh, you know, it's not just outages, etc. We also save a 
equipment. I mean, there, there have been lots of times and we've saved customers for buying new hardware, even though you know there's a consultant that came in and said, well, the only way you can solve this problem is throw more hardware at the problem. And we came in and said, no, wait, this is How what about you're doing Adjusting, wrong. rebalancing the, the VMs? Rebalancing, and some configuration change. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very often we're able to actually save that uh, for the customer. And great point about 3PAR. 3PAR actually has caught up incredibly fast in the last 12 months and how much they've been able to do. And we have this peak team. Peak team is, so, so to do something like this, to have this AI-driven, self-driven infrastructure, you need to restructure how companies, uh, how support is organized as well. So our support, for example, sits very close to engineering. And there is a new kind of team that other organizations don't typically have. We call it the peak team. And their job is really constantly looking to see what kind of signatures they can produce uh, from the install base working with engineering to prevent problems from happening again. They, they sit very, uh, very close to engineering, and they're always looking to see how can we prevent future problems from happening. That is their sole job. 3BAR has a big peak team now, and they have produced a pretty big heap of uh, signatures already for 3BAR, and you'll see the, all of that coming out very soon. The next thing I want to talk about, which I won't go into much detail, is because Aditya is going to go into it, is the recommendation engine. So we've done a lot of the prediction, uh, the analysis, et cetera, the case automation for support. Our support has tons of tools that, that helps them solve problems very quickly. And our customers are the ones that have told us, they've come back and said time and again of how they've never received such support uh, and never had such product experience before with any other enterprise vendor, storage or not, hardware or not. But where we're going now is very exciting. This is the part where I said, you know, if you go to a doctor, you don't just want to know what's wrong, even though they can tell you in an instant, you want to know how to fix it. Think of it with your Google Maps, for example, or any navigation system you're using. You don't want Google Maps to just tell you, hey, there is an accident. It's going to take you a long time. You want it to tell you, what should I do about it? Is it another route I can take that is fastest? And you want it to tell you in real time right away. And it has to be accurate. Right, so if you take that example, that is exactly where we are going um, with, uh, with InfoSight. For Nimble, we've been able to do it already for a while, uh, and we're bringing this recommendation capability uh, to other parts, so for example, a VMware layer to recommend different things about VMware. Just to give you an example of recommendations can be used, of course, for preventing issues, uh, just like we can say, hey, do an XYZ networking change. But it has to be very precise. So the example here is you know, change your network at certain port to avoid failover issues. So this is very actionable, very precise, because remember, our goal is to actually be able to take that action on your behalf very soon. And so we have to have high confidence. We don't want to go take an action on your behalf and then bring your system them down that wouldn't look very good um, and then improve uh, performance which is you know not it's not something that's preventing an outage but the slowness is the same thing these days as, as just not performing and being out and so say apply QoS to to a certain volume for example if it's a storage array uh, and then this optimization as well Calvin mentioned about you know not necessarily needing to go out and buy new hardware you can optimize things in your existing infrastructure see what's being underutilized and what is under uh, over pressure and have you mix things around. That is also a goal of our recommendation engine. Kind of amazing that a hardware vendor is going to try and help you not spend money. You'll come back and spend more money later because <laughs> yeah. you won't go anywhere. You come anywhere. back because and you trust us because exactly. we, we're helping you. Exactly. And so we, we, you know, we look at the attach rates and how many customers come back and they just, uh, you know, they become customers for life if, uh, if they think you're a, a trusted advisor to them. Yes. Just a thought. Um, how, how many people, customers, have actually said their, their uh, SLA has gotten better or some sort of metric to say that, you know, this InfoSight has really made a difference in the organization? Um, so, so we have... Uh, lots and lots of uh, compliments that come. I mean, we have compliments with explicit explicitives in there. There's our customers when they experience this. The main thing they tell us is we have never seen this kind of support. We've never had a vendor call us and tell us there was a problem that we didn't even know about. We've never had a vendor solve our problems so quickly. We do POCs where sometimes. In the POC, there have been other people in there with consultants trying to solve a problem which hasn't been solved for months and months. And we come in and with InfoSight, you know, within a day's worth of collecting data, we're able to tell them what they need and how they don't need to buy so much more hardware. They can just make tweaks. So we've had a lot of customers tell us. As to the specific statistics, um, I'm not sure exactly what. I don't know if it's 
Yeah, so we have an NPS score, right? We have an NPS score, which is, I don't know if it's here, but it's uh, over 85% uh, is the leading NPS score in the industry right now. And it's been very consistent at that, uh, at that level. Uh, so just to set a context for what this recommendation engine that Aditya is going to uh, share about, how does it know how a problem is to be solved using purely AI models and ML models. Um, what it really helps you is, you know, if you look at all the problems that your IT organizations try to solve, infrastructure problems, software problems, there is that 80-20 rule where 80% of the problem by numbers they see are, you know, they're rel relatively easy to solve. They're disruptive. You know, those should not occur either, but they're not too hard to solve. By number, the 20% of the problems that you face are the hardest problem, and they probably take up 80% of the cycles of the IT department. That 20% that are very hard to solve, very disruptive, and very expensive problems is what AI and ML really differentiates in the industry. The first 80% of the problem, you know, people can get there. They can hobble along. They can get there. They can start solving this problem. But those last 20%, those are the hard ones where you need some uh, very sophisticated data science uh, to go look at those problems and solve those problems. I won't go into what the recommendation engine components are from an AI perspective. I'm, I know I won't do justice to us, so Aditya will go into that. Um, but I'll just you know, have a, give you an example. Uh, it was a memory leak example uh, that, um, that I was talking about earlier. We saw there was some disruption in an array for uh, data availability. Turns out the root cause was an obscure memory leak. But our staff, our engineers, were able to figure that out very, very quickly. And the way they were able to figure that out very quickly was we have signatures from what memory allocation looks like and how it grows from our software code that we're sitting on for years and years and years. And they were able to see the pattern of how memory allocation looks like, what is the pattern of growth in a healthy system, and compare that to this system that was having a problem and very soon able, be able to detect that this is a memory leak problem because the pattern is not the same. So this is very obscure, very detailed problem, which because of pattern matching and having a wealth of information, you can actually do a model and, uh, and solve the problem. We'll go into details of some of them. And then we found, again, that 40 customers would have been exposed to that memory leak problem. So again, very surgical, 40 out of at that point, you know, more than 10,000 customers would have faced that memory leak problem, and we were able to prevent it. Um, just to leave you very quickly with this, um, Customers experience InfoSight, of course, through a product that is built uh, better, more resilient uh, through support experience we talked about. But they can actually log into InfoSight, which is a web portal, which is the direct interaction with InfoSight, and take a look at what's going on with their systems as well. And these are some screenshots from the portal. What you see here is uh, what we call um, a potential impact score. Very quickly, I think you're going to go into this, right? The idea here is that you know, traditional monitoring says high latency, bad, low latency, good. Or you set thresholds yourself for different kind of workloads. My production workload, this is my threshold for latency. My backup workload, this is the potential for latency, et cetera. But what we are able to do now is by looking at our support data and cor correlating that with when customers actually complain, we are able to see patterns where certain latencies are more important than certain other latencies. And so we are able to detect that for certain workloads, a 10 millisecond latency is tolerable, not a big problem. For certain other workloads, like OLTP workloads, uh, you know, 2 millisecond latency is not tolerable. Uh, and so we have now been able to inform our customers of when latency is actually a problem and not bother them with the alarm fatigue and keep bombarding them with, with every high latency. How did we detect that? I think we'll go into that. We looked at the I.O. patterns. There's a lot of uh, data science that went behind it, and we just saw a pattern out of that. Uh, and you know, So it's, it's very selective, selective, very surgical um, monitoring um, and alerting that we can do. I'll go past this. This is just the fact that we don't sit at our infrastructure layer, be it the ProLine, three-par, uh, SimpliVity. We're actually going higher into the applications layer. We started with VMware. We led Hyper-V. We're looking at big data applications as well. 
Uh, 3PAR, by the way, supports uh, VMware, uh, and that's been a very popular capability, the VM vision for 3PAR. You know, I'll go past this really quickly, but this is a slide that, a screenshot that you probably won't see from other block storage vendors, which is here what it's telling you is the latency that a virtual machine is experiencing and how much of that latency is coming from which segment in the infrastructure. The top color is the part of latency that's coming from the host itself, the server. The middle is a network, and the bottom is storage. And this is from a virtual machine perspective. And the reason I say other block storage vendors cannot show you this is because the block storage doesn't understand the boundaries of a virtual machine. Block storage understands a LUN, and a LUN can have tens or sometimes hundreds of virtual machines in it. And so we are able to break this down very accurately because of uh, AI and machine learning. Again, an example of, of, of us helping root cause uh, very quickly. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Aditya. I just want you to remember that this is coming, and to a large extent, in case of 3PAR, has already come to the entire HP portfolio of products. This is not just a nimble storage uh, story anymore. It got started with that. HP saw that and has invested very heavily in it. Uh, one testament to is that the fact that support was left intact with nimble storage, which was a big move to the company, but it was also a nod in the direction that this is the experience that we want the rest of our portfolio to have as well. Turn it on because it sends data outside of there. Well, well. Um, I mean, most of the customers. It's really cool stuff, but uh, do you still get pushed? I think between five to seven percent is what I would say without looking at what the, we do measure that. I just haven't looked at the very latest stats. We've had a lot of customers turn it on for the first time with us. It I was mean, cloud. It would be worth it if you knew the security, but I mean, we see yeah. the same thing with our customers that they just won't. It's like they can't turn it on. Yeah, we've had a lot of people, you know, we didn't have an alternative and the value was so compelling that a lot of customers that had these policies eventually worked through it and turned it on. Now 3PAR um, has, is building and they've done demos of the capability. The product is called, the code name is um, Ultron. But what that does is it learns in the cloud, but then it uh, actually encapsulates the learning, the models, and those models are then installed locally, just like a software update, for example. And then, exactly, so if you're a dark side, you can use that. You don't leverage the latest and great, right. greatest learnings, but that's okay. I mean, these learnings don't change so dramatically, right. uh, so quickly. And so 3PAR is gonna be able to offer that very quickly to you, where it's analytics at the edge. So you guys, itself. so that was gonna be my next question. You don't see enough people saying, no, we can't turn it on, that you've had to build outside of we like 3PAR. We did not, as Nimble, we did not, but I have to say we are going into higher accounts and more traditional accounts with HPE than we did. Yeah. Um, and so we will start seeing that. But then again, the innovation is coming from you know different teams, and we are we'll be able to support. We saw the need for three par much faster than we saw the need for nimble. So we were able to come with this edge analytics for three par. So for three par, for example, we see a lot of adoption coming quickly for the edge analytics. So same learning in the cloud, but packaged, but installed as a software update locally. Is there a particular industry that is more resistant to it that you're seeing, or is it just kind of all around? Oh, sorry. Some parts of Fed, you know, the, the, the three-letter Fed companies. Not all of Fed, I would say maybe 20% of it, right? Because people are becoming more open. And remember, we don't get any customer data. We just get machine data, with telemetry data. And there's also ways where you can obfuscate that. For 3PAR, for example, you can obfuscate some of that data as well. So it's not coming. We don't get identifiable information like IP addresses for them. Um, so I think that is mostly it. Financial institutes, again, depends on what the data is. Some of them are, uh, but we, I mean, at Nimble, we've had some pretty big financial institutions with very sensitive data, but the machine data is coming back. It's a trade-off. Availability, keeping up with latest and greatest features, you know, not having to focus on infrastructure versus that. We've, interestingly, we've had car manufacturers where they have their core engineering that does the design of the next models that is very, very, very closely guarded <laughs> labs. Uh, and I won't name the manufacturer, but it is in Europe. They actually opened that lab. They had arrays there, our storage arrays, Nimble arrays there. They sent telemetry from that lab for the very first time with uh, Nimble storage. They said they cannot, it's not connected to the cloud, but eventually when they saw the value, they opened up and actually sent, started sending telemetry back to us. Assuming it's mandatory to support on the arrays and maintain support on the arrays in order right. to access this? Right. 
Right, right. Yes. yes, definitely. definitely. Uh, we, don't we don't charge for it, for it uh, but, but we, we do require that you have support. Thank you, Roshna, for the introduction. Hi, everyone. I am Aditya Samala, and I've been working at HP InfoSight for over a uh, little over two years, uh, and I'm one of the data scientists there. Today, I'll be actually giving you an overview of the areas of data science development that we have at HP InfoSight. So these are the major areas of the data science development that we have at HP InfoSight. So the first one is the performance diagnostics and recommendation, which actually has uh, the performance recommendation engine that we released a little over a year ago that tells the customer what the problem is uh, why there is a problem and how to fix the problem. The other area is the resource forecasting. For instance, we do capacity forecasting. Uh, and we do capacity forecasting at various levels of the objects. We do capacity forecasting for the array level. We do capacity forecasting at volume level and folder level. Uh, as Ruchna has mentioned before, we receive the configuration data. So we have a lot of historical data that we have available with us. And using that historical data, we forecast the usage into future and when it reaches a certain threshold, we actually alert the customers saying you are at a 95% full and you would want to do something about it. The third area is the greenfield and brownfield sizing. What do I mean by that? As Roshna mentioned before, we have a lot of performance metrics that we collect and a lot of telemetry that is coming in every day. And using that telemetry, we've developed advanced models that predict CPU usage and cache usage depending on the workload characteristics that are run on the array. And we, we can use those models to guide customers to optimize the storage. At the same time, we can also help the sales engineers to pitch the right product to the customer depending on their workloads and what they're actually doing on the array. The fourth, point, the fourth uh, area of development is uh, data visualization and transparency. Uh, we have an InfoSight portal, and there is a page on InfoSight portal which is called InfoSight Labs, wherein all the data scientists put in all their cool applications before it makes to the front-end portal. Some of the examples would be, uh, estimation of replication bandwidth depending on the schedules or a noisy neighbor analysis on the volumes. Imagine a customer has a large environment and thousands and thousands of volumes. So you would want to summarize that and give the customer the volumes that are consuming the most resources or the volumes that are getting impacted by the latency and so on and so forth so that they can actually look at the top volumes that are affecting their environment and take action on that. Uh, the two areas that are under development are one is anomaly detection, the other one is autonomics. So as I mentioned before, the performance recommendation engine today gives explicit textual recommendation to the customer uh, on which they can act to resolve the issue and improve the performance. But in future, we envision a place wherein we can actually take those recommendations, act on that, and uh, improve the customer performance. And that is our end goal of having AI for the data center. So today I'll be digging deep into the performance diagnostics and recommendations, and I'll be tell, I'll be giving you an overview of our application. And if time permits, I'll also be doing a live demo, uh, and then I'll explain the uh, models uh, behind the performance recommendation engine and how do we do the recommendations. So these are the five major blocks that we considered uh, when we uh, built the recommendation engine. So the first one being uh, telling the story via an automation. So as we mentioned before, we had a lot of predictive analytics before, but they're all plots, which requires a lot of context for the user to interpret and then take recommendations of, off of it. But we've gone the we've gone an additional step wherein we are now we are actually telling the customers what is your problem, why there is a problem, and how do you fix the problems. And then uh, when we build this uh, recommendation engine, we had default sensitivity settings and default time range for which the performance will be analyzed for. But then we wanted to be flexible to the users, and we wanted uh, users to have a say in the sensitivity settings and uh, the time settings. I'll be go digging deeper into the sensitivity settings and the time periods uh, in my future slides. The third one is the coverage and the accuracy part. As Roshna mentioned before, 
most of the problems, 80% of the problems cause only the 20% of the pain, but the, the, and the right end of the spectrum wherein you have only less problems, but they are the most painful and time consuming problems. So what we did was we wanted to solve uh, the, uh, the common problem which would lead us to giving beneficial recommend recommendations to all of the customers or most of the customers that we have. At the same time, we are spending a lot of time in automating those time consuming problems. Uh, as, as she mentioned before, we have uh, uh, a support team and, uh, a pro uh, and a peak team which is called performance engineering team who are uh, dedicated to optimizing the performance on the array. And we actually collect a lot of feedback from them, uh, try to uh, automate the, uh, the signatures that we can and add it to the recommendation engine and integrate to them. And we want to save customers time. We don't want uh, to solve, we don't want to spend time on the known bug. We want to automate as many bugs as possible and integrate it to the recommendation engine. The fourth point establishes the same. And the fifth one is transferability to all HPE product line. So when we developed this application, we wanted it to be as globally adaptable as possible. Uh, given that we have we receive the same set of data, we can apply these models to any product line and give the customers the benefit of the recommendations. So let's let me quickly show you how the app looks like today. So if you look at the right side, if you look at the left panel, uh, you have the uh, th there is an object of storage interest. I mean, the customer can select the storage uh, or the pool that he is interested in, and then the time period uh, is set for one week. But then there are additional filters that are called uh, the schedule time filter and latency sensitivity, where the customers can actually use those and manipulate and play around and get tailored recommendations. I'll show uh, more on those in the next slides. And then in the middle panel, you have a time series, and you have operations. And you have different kinds of operations. They're just broken down by the type. Uh, the first one is the random read, sequential read, and the write ops. And you can observe the red uh, bars there. And that is the potential impact score that Roshna was mentioning earlier. I'll explain the math with how we uh, come up with the potential impact score in the future slide. So this is our uh, major uh, uh, place. I mean, this is the place wherein we tell what the problem is, why there is a problem, and how to fix the problem. I'll, I'll, I'll be showing you more examples or some of the examples that we actually give out through our recommendation engine in the next slide. So that way you have it by priorities as well. Yes, right? yes. And we also have, for example, a customer, uh, a story, I mean, a customer can have multiple problems and we would want to tell them what to solve first in order to get the most performance benefits. So that's how we, that, that's the reason why we have first priority issues and second priority issues, so on and so forth. It depends on the number of problems the customer has and we come up with the priorities and we tell them the recommendations uh, to solve those issues. So first example is the CPU under provisioning. You can see in the diagnosis that uh, we say that CPU saturation is affecting your random read and the write performance, and these are the recommendations. It's very interesting. You can see that we don't recommend the customers to buy a hardware straight away. As Rochna has mentioned before, we want to try alternate routes in which we can actually solve the problem. So that is the recommend that, that's how the recommendations are listed here. You can see the first recommendation which says consider QoS limits on high CPU volumes. And then there is an additional supplementary volume details page that tells you the volumes that are consuming the most CPU. I mean, imagine a customer uh, environment which has 1,000 volumes. If, you, if, if we are presenting only the recommendations and the customer has again, again has to go back, look through the volumes, sort the volumes, see the volumes that are actually consuming the most CPU, and then apply this recommendation on it. Instead of that, we wanted to make the customer life as easy as possible, and that is the reason we wanted to make this this application as a one-shop thing. And we had the supplementary volume pay, details page wherein it lists all the volumes that are consuming the resource, and you can directly apply the recommendation on these volumes and achieve the performance benefit and improve. Yeah. Over time. Yes. So it depends on the interval, of course, could be like month end, etc. These are cycles. Yes. Okay. I'll, I'll be showing, showing you how it's very basics. flexible in the future. Yeah. Can be taken account for to, to yes. normalize your data. Huh? Yes. yes. Right. Yeah. So another example is cache under provisioning. It is very similar to the CPU. Again, you have a supplementary volume uh, page associated with it, and you can see the uh, the recommendations in order. Again, we follow the same pattern. We don't uh, ask the customers to upgrade or buy new hardware straight away. We'll ask them to try a series of steps 
that can actually resolve the issue. And then even before upgrading uh, the soft, uh, upgrading the hardware, we ask the customer to confirm it, confirm it with support. And then, you know, we, we want to be sure of our recommendation. We want to be confident. We don't want customers to add hardware uh, unnecessarily. If we can solve that, doing other uh, steps. So this is one of the rare problems that we were talking about. Uh, so we had a lot of customer cases uh, in, historically uh, that were calling into support and saying that uh, they had a problem and support had to dig through a lot of performance stats to come up with the root cause analysis, which happens to be the which happens to be your disks are saturated. So we, in order to actually avoid that time, we wanted we wanted to automate that entire process, and that is. So we took the uh, help of support and uh, the peak team to actually identify all those signatures. And then we automated. We built a machine learning model on top of it to come up with the signature. Uh, I'll explain uh, how we built that model in the future slides. So another important example is the unknown category. So th this is where we want to be as transparent as possible to the customer. So we know that there is a problem with your environment. Uh, there is high, there, you are experiencing uh, high latencies, but we are not sure about the root cause. That's when we'll ask the customers to call in to support, and support can actually, with the help of performance engineers, can dig deep and find the root cause analysis. And obviously, we'll be taking in the feedback of performance engineers. Uh, we'll, we are actively automating a lot of signatures right now and integrating it to our recommendation engine to drive this unknown percentage down. Uh, this is how, uh, if, if the system is performing well and if there are no recommendations, this is the typical message that we put out. We just say that your storage is performing well within the designated range and you don't have to do anything about it. So let, let me dig, through, let me tell you or let me show you how flexible we are with the recommendation engine, what are the other features that we have in the recommendation engine. So you, if you look through the uh, time series data that is presented in this slide, you can see that most of the operations are actually done outside the business hours. So what if the customer is not interested in the recommendations that include these uh, uh, outside business hour operations that actually have high performance impact? So they can actually use the uh, schedule time filter option that we provided, click through the days uh, which, which they are interested in, include the days that they are interested in. They can also select uh, the hours in each day that have to be included, and they can click the filter analysis to the schedule and our recommendations will be tailored according to the time period they selected. Another example is probleming, prob, uh, drilling in on the problem event. If you look at this time series, the pro it is very uh, certain, I mean, it's very, it's very evident that the problem is actually pertaining to a specific time period. But if you do the analysis across this time period, that effect might be normalized. But if, what if you want to look in, into the problem event and get, get the recommendations only pertaining to that problem event? We can actually do that. The customers can uh, do that. We, they can zoom in on the time period and click on the filter analysis to current zoom button. And the recommendations will be tailored uh, only to that particular problem event or the time period that has been selected. So the coverage and the accuracy part. Uh, I, th this is where we actually discuss uh, the models behind the recommendation engine. How do we how do we know if the problem is worth alerting or how did we come up with different uh, models, such as regression models or classification models, to make these recommendations? So as we mentioned before, using average latency was alone not sufficient. We had to actually uh, see uh, uh, the numbers alone didn't make sense. We had to have actually, we needed a lot more context to call out a problem. And I want, I want to show you how we actually went about that. So if you look at this particular plot, you can see that we have latency breakdown available at different operation sizes, and obviously for different uh, op types. Uh, let's say you have a two millisecond latency. Two millisecond latency might be uh, impacting you very severely at a lower block sizes, but as you tend to go along the right side of the spectrum where you do larger block operations, uh, the latency, it, it, they tend to become more latent, but the workloads that are running it are less sensitive. So if you take the scale and see the two millisecond latency, you can see that it is actually having a high impact on the lower operation sizes. But if you see the two millisecond latency that you're getting at a 500 of a KIB operation size, it's not that significant. So that is the reason what we did was we actually built machine learning models at each of the block sizes uh, that predict this uh, latency impact. And then we do a weighted average across 
and come up with a combined or a normalized latency metric that tells us uh, how high or I mean how severe your problem is, which is categorized in the scores of uh, high, medium, or low. Uh, I'll show you the uh, I'll show you an example how it is being applied here. So if you look at this plot, uh, you can see that. We just have five minutes remaining. Sure. So why don't you go ahead and? Yeah, I think I'm almost done. So okay. I'm going to do it. So if you have, if you look at this plot, you can see that there is a latency of 15.3 milliseconds, but the potential impact is actually low. But if you look at this plot, there is a latency of 9.4 milliseconds, but the impact is high. So we want to alert customers based on that, not on the average latency alone. So the strategies that we use to actually cover and build more classifiers is, given that there is a high latency event, how do you predict that your resource is the bottleneck? So we built a lot of regression models uh, for different resources, for different op types, and for different uh, array types as well. Uh, like we distinguish between the hybrid versus all flesh. And based on the different regression models that we build, uh, we can actually predict the probability of your resource uh, being the cost for your latency. And you've seen this plot already. So we are trying to uh, so, uh, we are trying to solve most complex problems uh, that actually give you a lot of pain. And I just wanted to explain what is the difference between a regression and a classification. Is imagine you are trying to predict the amount of rainfall in California. You would be using a regression. Regression is about predicting a quantity of something. Uh, uh, you are trying to predict a continuous variable. Whereas in classification, imagine you are trying to predict whether it would rain today or not. It's more like an event. You are pre trying to predict an event. So, so when I said uh, we used uh, classifiers to predict the SSD bandwidth saturation, what we did was because support had a lot of customer cases in, in the past, they've documented all of that. So we went ahead, took the data that is pertaining to that specific time range, and we built uh, machine learning classifiers. So we use supervised learning to bring machine learning classifiers on top of that. And that tells us uh, with, so if you look at the left hand side of the uh, slide, you, you can actually see that it gives out a probability. So what it tells is that uh, given that, so the, pro the probability of problem A causing high latency is 12%. The probability of problem B causing high latency is 3%. And you can clearly see a winner in there, which is problem A that causes 97, prob that gives us 97 probability. This is how we can actually rank and you know tell the c customers with confidence that this is the event or this is the particular signature that is causing the problem in your environment. And you can actually uh, take in the recommendations that we give to fix that particular problem and achieve the performance benefit. So the other way we actually quantify or pick different be, between different classifiers is using precision and recall. So what do I mean by that? By precision, what I mean is that you, uh, if, if the model tells us that there are 10 positive cases or 10 SSD bandwidth saturation, and if you go ahead and look if you have a precision of 90%, what does what does that mean? It means that nine out of the 10 actually turned out to be a positive hits, and one is a false positive. So ideally, you would want a large precision and a large recall, and this plot signifies that. The better the area under curve is, the better uh, the classifier is. This is how we pick out the best classifiers and integrate that into the recommendation engine. So as I mentioned before, the feedback loop is uh, very important. And uh, we actually collect a lot of feedback from support and uh, the uh, performance engineers and automate a lot of uh, uh, signatures that are more time consuming. So the assumptions that make the different levels of uh, OS changes as you evolve, right? Yes. yes. We, we continuously retrain the models. Yeah, Exactly. That is the reason we have the PR curves and we con constantly monitor the PR curves and we update our models. Yeah. And then uh, in order to actually help uh, the support and performance people, uh, performance engineering people to come up with more signatures, or uh, we, what we decided to do is we built an event labeling app wherein the uh, performance team can go ahead and input the uh, storage. I mean, if they have worked on a customer case and if they want to actually if they want that to be automated, they can actually input that particular storage and tag the specific time period during which the issue has occurred. And then we'll go ahead, uh, collect the metadata about it, like all the sensors that are required to identify that particular issue. And then we'll uh, train uh, based off that data and we'll be building new signatures and integrating them into the recommendation engine. Another approach we use is unsupervised learning, wherein you don't know the labels and you 
no customer has called in with this particular problem, but you still want to solve that problem. How do you do that? You use unsupervised learning to do that, wherein we throw a bunch of data at our algorithms, and uh, the algorithm tries to pick different clusters. And depending on the clusters, if you get if you get different enough clusters, we'll actually be digging deep into those clusters and try. We'll try to find out what is unique among those clusters and what is a common scenario that is tying those clusters. And then we can come up with the diagnosis and the recommendation pertaining to those clusters. Uh, this is just uh, the earlier slide is trying. To, so there are four different clusters, and this slide just tells you what those clusters are. They are actually separated by the operation type. Like this blue uh, cluster is predominantly the random read write, write group, and the yellow one is sequential write group, and so on and so forth. Um, the fifth point is the transferability of the product lines. Uh, basically, we are trying. What we are trying to do right now is we are trying to extend these recommendations to VM Vision as well. Uh, and then, because of the collected pipeline code sharing that we have, we've uh, we've replicated the VM Vision uh, analytics on three power pretty quickly. And we plan to do the same thing across different products. And that's it. Thank. Uh, if there is enough time, I can actually do the demo. But it's up to you. Yeah, we have lunch waiting and sure. another session. So I think you had a lot of screenshots there that were useful. So. Yeah. Are there any questions? questions? Questions, or we can actually take them at lunch if you guys are like chopping at the bit to get at lunch out there. Well, this is good stuff. Really, really fast. Yeah. Well, they'll be around. I don't. You're here. Yeah. On, she's actually for those of you staying. She's actually got a session at symposium tomorrow. tomorrow yeah. You bring him along to do some of this stuff too. No, so tomorrow we'll have Wiley from 3 Power Kicking. Oh, nice. Yeah, and he'll be doing some demos on 3 Power uh, and showing you the InfoSight working with 3 Power. So, for those of you, I think four of you are staying. 